Welcome to the seminar today uh, between James Green and myself. Uh, we're going to try to do a multi-perspective kind of uh, discussion, kind of like an interview in a way, uh, based on understanding embedded devices and firmware and OT. Now, we recognize this is uh, a level one discussion, right? This is not, uh, it's not, you know, it's your basics introduction. It's, it's a little bit more than that. But the idea is, is we're trying to give you the basics and the vocabulary to have a discussion around firmware versus uh, not knowing anything at all. And the concept of firmware is a pretty complicated picture. So let me introduce myself. I'm Ron Brash. I'm the Director of Cybersecurity of Insights at Verve, and I'm also a geek. And my compadre here, James Green, Director of Field Services and Awesomeness. And a bit of background, uh, Verve Industrial Protection has been around for over 25 years. We have a deep background in, in ICS control systems and how they work. Uh, largely due to the nature of the business. We started off as an integrator. Uh, we have a very large team of uh, experts across the board, whether it's in IT, OT, ICS, uh, over 10 years of doing techno uh, technology validated assessments for industrial control systems, and we have software and services. So in a nutshell, uh, we're not fresh to the game. We began at the bottom and worked our way towards IT, uh, which is a very different approach than our competitors. Context for today's webinar. So I really wanna focus on embedded devices as they relate to industrial applications. Uh, we have embedded devices that are in our systems at home, you know, our, our washing machines. The, the purpose is not to have that kind of flavor to this discussion. It's to talk about the industrial ones that actually control things, right? The cyber physical ones. And I want to do this in a way where an asset owner, IT security, or even some level of management uh, can understand this. So what I want to do is to explain why regular IT style discussions don't apply to firmware. Uh, the basic components of an embedded system, uh, some basic embedded system terminology for the purposes of cybersecurity, not to go design a system, but uh, to actually kind of have discussions around it. And what are some of the insights that I know from working in embedded systems and bringing products to market? And ultimately what we can do about it uh, from you know the owner perspective, right? I don't, ex if you buy a product, you're not gonna be doing the updates on it most likely uh, inside the firmware. So you're gonna be applying whatever the vendor gives you. And if they don't, what do we do about it? So there's a bunch of differences in those types of situations. And what are the realities of the product development, right? Because we might have unrealistic expectations. And then also too, we have what are the realities for remediation uh, on our end as the, as the purchaser? So that's kind of what I want to do to discuss those points. The current situation from 35,000 feet and, and take this with a grain of salt. This is just to give you a bit of, a bit of context. Embedded is everywhere. If you're looking at sheer numbers of devices, they are a magnitude 10 times greater than your Windows boxes, or your Cisco boxes. On average, it's between two and 10 times greater uh, in terms of assets, right? You might have one router, one firewall, or one router and one switch, and uh, maybe 10 Windows machines or 100 Windows machines, and you'll have close to 1,300 uh, PLCs and various sensors. So do keep in mind, uh, the numbers grow up and it looks more like a tree. These are embedded, it's everywhere. You can't get away from it. And uh, even if it's you know physical assets, assets that are bolted to the walls, the, the same principles will be applied to pacemakers and dialysis machines, et cetera. So do keep that in mind. Now I have a few interesting stats. Uh, if you look purely at CVEs, yes, I know it's a broken thing, but it is a metric. 77.5% of CVEs are between the levels 4.8. The average is around 6.6. If we look at that, that's telling us there's a lot of vulnerabilities that we're not focusing on. We're generally, most companies and most groups are focusing on the vulnerabilities that are the nine, the tens. I would argue to look at more of the low mediums because those actually uh, are often put together with the more serious ones in a successful attack. That's, that's why I, I'm interested to look at that stat, right? It's sometimes uh, we look to the wrong area of the curve and we should be focusing somewhere else. The other stat is most of these products, uh, you know, I averaged out most industrial systems, but on average it's five or more years uh, lifetime. Some are 15, 20 years. Um, but as we move towards more consumable products like IIoT, like Raspberry Pis, they won't have those lifespans. So do keep in mind that these systems do live for a long time and they're off, often uh, will exist for the ent entire lifetime of that site. So, if we're looking at the kinds of embedded devices in OT and ICS, they're often a different group of flavors. And I did this chart to kind of illustrate that, right? We have distributed designs, right? DCSs, we have standalone controllers, uh, 
Then you have real time as a property, uh, but not necessarily, right? And this is real time, not in the way of the people that think of the cloud. The cloud and the web developers, they think of real time in you know 30 milliseconds, which is roughly the window of, of how humans can observe uh, any differences in lag and time. We're talking about microseconds, uh, 100 microseconds, or or even a, even a more minute amount of time, and this is deterministic. Uh, they can be networked, but they might not be networked over Ethernet. In many cases, a lot of systems are not. And then you have that other flavor of of things, which might be you know various sensors, various inputs, uh, and those those go into uh, into the standalone systems or the DCSs, so some point of uh, some point of system that integrates into it. Um, they could be fluid, right? So there might be one, there might be a distributed and that's all they do. Uh, it might be a standalone and that's all it does, but they might overlap based on the industry and needs. So do keep that in mind. But for the most part, and I'm gonna harp on this, is that embedded systems and industrial applications are largely based on performance and functional requirements. And that functional part and that scope of functional is, is the main key to differentiate that between a commodity asset for the most part. For, for this, I want, I, again, to continue, continue setting the stage, the timeline of sensationalized embedded vulnerabilities and events in OT in general is, uh, is kind of growing. And there's a reason for that. And part of that is because A, as we get more exposure and knowledge uh, becomes ubiquitous on the internet, you'll see that, you know, starting with the Stuxnet attack, uh, targeting a Siemens S7, that was a functional attack, right? If we exclude the Windows components out of it, it was a functional attack that targeted the logic uh, of the Siemens S7s. Then we kind of skip forward and we go after the Siemens Cipertech in crash override. Again, it was a functional uh, issue and then they were being manipulated. 2017, the Trisys attack, they were using uh, the software and, and basically copying it to a certain extent uh, and building their own version of it. Now, those are three main events that involve embedded systems, but they're not necessarily limited to, and I keep hinting to there's other aspects there that have led to those systems being exploited, right? Um, because they, those systems are designed for a functional perspective. Now, the other half of this kind of gets interesting where I picked three kind of types of vulnerabilities that have kind of put the world up in arms. We have Spectre uh, and Meltdown, right, which are cache related hardware vulnerabilities that are in a variety of CPUs. Almost everybody was affected, but to certain degrees. I've yet to see someone actually exploit that. And I've actually yet to see someone actually exploit Rowhammer in the wild too. Uh, so these type of hardware vulnerabilities, they might sound amazing and, you know, a billion devices are affected, but there's other factors in play that make it a nuanced art. We had re the recent Urgent 11 vulnerabilities and we also had the Trek stack. And so those last three represent an area of panic that I don't think that the industry really needed, or at least if you're an asset owner, you wouldn't want to know about. There's other vulnerabilities that you don't know about and they're everywhere and they're constantly being fixed. Uh, you'll see things like BusyBox or Linux or Glib or, or take a pick of a library. Those are all being fixed in the background and you never see a vulnerability advisory come up for one of those in an embedded product nine times out of 10. So keep that in mind. I wouldn't be worried about what the news is telling you. I'd be worried about the ones that are silently sitting inside. So Ron, on that last page that you were just covering, um, can you elaborate on a few of the reasons why embedded vulnerabilities have been on the rise over the last number of years? Sure. So a lot of that, I think, might have something to do with open source and, or the integration of more off-the-shelf software. That, that's part of it, right? The, you, you're going less from proprietary real-time operating systems uh, to something more ubiquitous. People are picking a platform like, you know, free, free RTOS. That might be one reason why you're seeing more of that because these this piece of software packages are elsewhere and people are seeing it kind of grow uh, horizontally, right? If it's in that product, it's probably in another one that I have. And so you'll see that kind of grow. If you also consider that everything is being connected and because of the, the Stuxnet, because of the Trisys, you're seeing more awareness for it. And so you might see, you know, more researchers looking at it because A, it's a way to prove yourself, right? We can all play the C how many CVEs do I have to my name game? Uh, researchers are doing it to, you know, uh, either advance their own careers or they're also doing it to enhance their business model. So cybersecurity is also an Ouroboros, a snake eating its own tail. So when I push there's vulnerabilities and I offer a solution to fix it, it's a self-feeding loop. So that's one reason, another reason why this is growing. And so you will continue to see this as this becomes more commonplace 
uh, until we wind up probably with information overload and fatigue. Okay, and then uh, the last thing that I had on this page as well was, um, you know, with all of these vulnerabilities, it's not only about the costs associated with an attack, um, but it's also, it, they also all have safety implications as well. Um, can you talk around that just a little bit? Sure, so the, for a regular vulnerability, right, it's in the IT space, it's generally around data and security of data. Uh, or permissions to access things that you shouldn't, right? In these types of cases, uh, these systems are cyber physical. And so the, the very, I call it SRP, safety, reliability, and productivity, those, that's the CIA triad for embedded systems for the most part in OT. Now, some controllers might be doing very little, right? Just monitoring for motion. Um, they're probably not going to have that much of a safety impact, but certain other ones might have logic on them that controls something else. So you will still need to apply some of your logic on that, but these systems are generally uh, in, a, in, in a place where some sort of risk or health, safety, and environment factor, HSE, will be, uh, will be present. Okay, great. So everyone's gonna say, but CVEs, aren't they the same? Uh, no, and there's a lot of academic work on that. So let me kind of show you the process of this from the IT side and explain why it breaks. Vulnerability disclosure is the least, right? You, you get something from Microsoft or the NBD National Vulnerability Database, and hopefully uh, there's been a process of disclosure and a fix will follow shortly or already is available. The organization says, oh, what assets do I have? Scans for them or has their inventory and they know what's affected. Then you have uh, another version of that where that organization then will patch them and push them through. Unfortunately, uh, this kind of breaks where A, there is no fix, uh, B, the organization doesn't know where those assets are. And you might say, well, okay, we'll just scan for them. Well, that would be great if we knew that that business was never changing. We, that would be great if you're in a large organization, let's say it was oil and gas, and you're not constantly divesting, which is selling off assets. Or so there's constantly this tug of war, who owns what, or, or, or for example, a, a section of a network was never online before and now it is. So it, this horizon is always changing, right? There's new mountains popping up under the ocean and you'll find them unfortunately the wrong way sometimes. But it's also easier, even if a fix did exist, it's harder to, uh, harder to deal with them, right? You can't just issue a patch even if it was available. Um, you might, I'll talk a little bit more about that. And I see there's a question there about uh, FOSS, which is open source components. That would be stuff like Linux. I'll talk about that a bit more and how that really affects it, but it's actually very literally, it's from my perspective and your perspective as an asset owner, it'll be almost indistinguishable than a proprietary solution, uh, despite the appearance of open source. So I do keep that in mind. Um, I see there's another question about formal methods. I'll talk a bit more about that as well later. Uh, and that'll be, um, I'll try to keep it short just because that's a whole session on its own. So techno, lingo, bingo. So to differentiate embedded versus commodity systems, it kind of looks like this. Uh, embedded systems require specialized OS and drivers. Um, they have a specialized function, function that is generally cyber physical, and they focus on sub-millisecond latencies. You'll notice, though, as we move towards things like iPads, where everything is soldered on, or even the MacBook Airs, where you can't even update RAM or sometimes even uh, SSDs in some cases for certain types of laptops now, the, the, the lines between what is embedded and what is commodity is, is, is very, very close to each other. Generally speaking, I try to differentiate it, is embedded systems are to do a, a functional task that, in, that has an imp implication on the real world. Now, you might argue that playing Candy Crush is not an implication of the real world. That's a, that's a philosophical question. But those lines are starting to blur. Uh, James, I think you, you had a, that same question to me and said, you know, what do I do in those cases? Uh, maybe you want to, to raise that here. Yeah, so I, I, my question around um, embedded versus commodity really is, uh, given that they all have similar components, what really separates the two? Sure. So I think the real separation between the two is the ubiquitous ability to patch them 
to go grab an update. I can go buy a MacBook Air. Yes, there's an Apple bootloader and it comes with Mac OS, but I can go put Windows on that tomorrow. I can go put Linux on that tomorrow. I can virtualize Apple OS as it should I choose to. There's ways to do it or generally commodity systems are generally virtualizable. Um, and in most cases, right, I have, of course, I have a Microsoft Surface in front of me. That definitely is not, doesn't have replaceable internals, but I also have a Lenovo ThinkPad next to it, and that has replaceable internals. So some of those lines are blurring, but generally it's the ubiquitous ability to go get software, to go do general computation, and, and to work from that. I think that's the main differentiator. Okay. And when you talk about going to get software, and you've, you've hinted at this, um, but how is open source, at the end of the day, how is open source affecting embedded devices? I think uh, that's a big business discussion and I think that's the pros and cons to both, right? Proprietary software appears to be slower moving because you generally see it go in big shifts, right? If you're looking at VxWorks, it'll come in a big shift. There's not a patch every day. If you're looking at, if you were a company that was doing something that had a, an embedded web server on it that had some sort of, you know, uh, JS JavaScript related library on it or framework, you'll notice that there's a ton of patches every day, right? There's tons of imports. And so open source for right or wrong uh, is pushing that patch DevOps style cycle onto an embedded uh, environment and that won't work well. Um, unless you're in strict control of, the, of those patches, strict control of the testing and in strict control of, of anything else that's gonna be happening on it, right? Cause you have cycles. Now, of course, vendors need to pick up the pace on those uh, on those cycles, but nonetheless, it's it's putting them into a very challenging uh, situation at, that they can't really deal with. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about why open source has some limitations on it, and uh, I'll give you guys some homework on a certain legal event uh, that occurred several years ago, and that might explain a bit more why I don't see it as much of a differentiator. So what is embedded hardware? Embedded hardware uh, is a collection of electronics in a neat package, I'll call it neat, that requires certain drivers and configurations. It's specific software to power on the device and peripherals. You don't just plug in uh, a chip and hope for the best, even if it had power on the, on the, the basically the, the power rail for it, even if you had a ground, it doesn't work that way. Even a system of chip, it has code inside of it that makes it load, microcode, or it's, or it's basically an ASIC or embedded into the, the ROM. And it, it's a bunch of bits and bytes that are sent to the chips often very early on that enable functionality or even after that, the transferring of data and the execution of, of the logic that your C program uses that, for example. But all of this, uh, this, is the, the, this is the system, right? It's a holistic thing. I hate that word, but it's a holistic thing that, that encompasses it. Now, if we look, at my diagram, you can see there's a whole bunch of different components there. And often, you know, in your cell phone, all of this will be in the same chip that's mounted onto a, a daughter board or a PCB. The reality, a lot of these systems in the past were kind of separate chips, right? I could get a different CPU from a, that would, then you have an FPGA over here that's doing something else that's monitoring, monitoring your, your other, uh, your inputs and outputs. Uh, you'll have networking chips and you'll have external FIs. Uh, there's a bunch of different chips here. But if anyone that's ever played with a Raspberry Pi, there's, you know, you get the board and you know there's a couple different chips on it that are soldered, right? Your RAM, uh, your GPU, your CPU. And then you'll have, you know, you have to put a, board, a daughter board on for your displays or any input. So do keep in mind, uh, it's often a bunch of things that kind of go into that package. So I'm gonna play a little game. Uh, this is the first robot in my deck. I hide robots in them to see if you're paying attention. There may or may not be a prize at the end. Uh, it'll be maybe a prize of life, but there is robots in my presentation. So just keep you on your toes. Uh, so firmware is a symbiotic relationship tying hardware to software that operate a device. It's an encompassing concept that all, all of this gets called firmware, but separating out uh, a software update from the whole update becomes uh, and the reason being is very, very rarely will you ever see um, on an embedded system in an industrial world, like a PLC, the separation out from a piece of logic from an actual firm, a complete firmware update. So one is obviously very, less risky than the other, but you never would know that by the language on, for most OEMs. The kinds of updates firmware can have, and this is where I'm kind of going that I'll use a cell phone as the example. 
So generally, they come in two formats, a base OS and per application, right? And almost all modern smartphones work on this premise. Some are slower than others. Uh, if you take Samsung, for example, they abandon you versus maybe Google if you have a Pixel. So you have an OS inside of it, right? And maybe you get an update to that once a month if you're on a Google Pixel that's under, uh, under a lifetime still. Then you have the per app updates and those would be like your, your Google Maps or whatever. You get frequently will get updates for those. In the industrial world, those two things are packaged together. And so it's very, very different. And so if you remember the cases where if, you're, you know, if you have a cell phone provider and you have to wait for them to give you an update, think of uh, the industrial world like that, where it's so tightly coupled for whatever reason, um, there's plenty, that those things are all covered in that ISP provider update. And so there, that's a very big distinguishment between commodity embedded systems that are frequently available and also thrown out uh, or retired uh, versus these industrial ones. They're very tightly uh, controlled. There's a gatekeeper there for a variety of reasons that are largely on the business side. Yeah, so Ron, that's a, that's a really good example of uh, commodity versus, versus embedded uh, as far as the releases go. And one of the questions that I have is, um, you know, when we talk about vendors updating a package for uh, providing um, an updated firmware release, how often, if ever, do they actually um, release versions that are specific to a single vulnerability to where it's not, uh, it's not a feature release, it, it doesn't encompass all kinds of different things, it's, it's specific to a vulnerability that has been identified, um, and if they are doing that, how are they going about actually testing those devices based off of the current versions? Because as you know, especially in the OT world, um, you might walk into a plant and it's gonna have, it, it might be all Rockwell PLCs, but they're gonna be multiple different versions. Yeah, so <laughs> there, there's plenty of challenges there and maybe, I'll, I'll maybe those will kind of be teased out along the way, but we're making an epic assumption that the ver that a version of something that's identified as weak, let's say version 1.08, is uh, has these vulnerabilities in it. In the case of like VxWorks, it's very specific. You're assuming that everything with that version of VxWorks was vulnerable, and so pick your OEM, whether it's Rockwell or GE or Schneider Electric. Every all those companies need to go out and start hunting at their products, assuming they even know what's in them, right? A bill of materials, but that's very tricky, and that's a whole other discussion on its own but it's, they need to know what's in those products. And so there might be conditions where just because you, a vulnerability is present does not mean it's exploitable. And there, there's a variety of reasons that I'll talk more about that. But most of the time, uh, these updates, when you do see them from vendors are reactionary. So everyone saw a flurry of updates for VxWorks or for some vendors, e Ethernet IP slash SIP uh, implementations. Those were reactionary to the way that the media and cybersecurity groups all of a sudden latched onto them. It's for right or wrong. And so you'll see, you'll see more of that, but you won't see uh, incremental updates, like rolling updates. Uh, I think we'll talk about that a bit later, but there's no rolling updates in industrial systems. And largely because it's too expensive to do it. Uh, and the more you go towards open source, the harder that is to control the variables for your testing, even if you automate it. Uh, because cyber physical is just way harder and way slower. You can't virtualize it, uh, which is another problem. And I know someone's going to suggest, well, why can't we virtualize hardware? Again, that's not the right answer. Um, virtualization is a tool that needs to be used in the right applications. It's not a, not a panacea. Ah, Mr. Ken, good question. Uh, what would a good build materials look like for an embedded system? Well, I'll try to, I'll try to answer that in the tail end of this. Uh, we'll see. So what is in firmware and how is it made? And I'm going to keep this very, very generic. But if you look at what is in firmware, you'll have everything. And, and this is kind of based off of a commodity a Linux type system, or even VxWorks will look very similar to this. It's a, a monolithic kernel. It might be a section of this. Very rarely will you have a bootloader updates. Very rarely will you have microcode in them. But Generally speaking, uh, operating system code, right, uh, will represent a different set of vulnerabilities or flaws, and the file system will often have a subset of those as well, right? But I want to want to remind people that there's often firmware inside of firmware, and that's a very key distinction. When you look at, if you've ever ran Linux and you have an NVIDIA graphic card or or pick some proprietary one, 
when it goes to load those drivers, it actually is loading a section of binary code into, into memory. And then that's exe, you know, doing a bunch of work on, on the back end that you're not aware of. So there's firmware inside of firmware and there can actually be an implication between that and something else. So your computer might work fine with one graphic card, uh, but you might not work well with another. So do keep in mind, there is interactions there at play that make understanding firmware and any sort of uh, anomaly very tricky to track. And so the more you can control your environment, the better off you are in keeping that system stable, which is a key function of what we do here in industrial land. Firmware is built almost the same as a regular application, but it's far more intensive for the most part. You'll have a tool chain uh, or a platform of tools that, that have like a cross compiler. So if you've ever written you know, C on x86, uh, you know you just go app get install GCC. When you want to compile something for an environment such, uh, such as an ARM chip or a MIPSL chip or PowerPC, uh, you'll need a separate set of tool chains and you might need to build them and compile them for that architecture that you're building. You'll often see this will call uh, a build route. Uh, you'll take scarce code for the most part, uh, assuming that it's compiled. Uh, you'll take the compiled code, assuming a game, and then you're going to prepackage it. And when you prepackage it, you're kind of taking everything together that you need. So if you've ever built a binary, you'll notice that you know every there might be uh, temporary files uh, like a .a or a .so that are ignored, and or so you can pick, cherry pick some of those, and you'll have configuration files. And you'll cherry pick all that, put it together, kind of stage it, and then you'll put that together as a distributable. And that distributable uh, often can be a single binary, or it can be something wrapped inside of whatever the vendor's uh, preferred update package might be, right? So if you have an open WRT one, you'll have a kind of an FS style image and you'll send that out to, to all, everyone that has it. And ultimately, of course, you test and deploy it. This is almost no different than an application. And this is true for open source and this is true for uh, proprietary systems. The problem is where this becomes the deploying part. And, what, and there's a specific question, on, well, open source should you know, give me the right to fix it. It doesn't. Because of that linking to hardware, some vendors don't have to necessarily give you stuff uh, that will compile, right? There's nothing in GPL that says, I need to give you code that compiles. I just need to give you code. It also doesn't say anything about, do I have to give you a mechanism to install your compiled code on my system? And there's, a, there's the research piece for you. It's called TiVoization. So there was a company called TiVo, or I produced a product called the TiVo. It's basically a set-top box for TV recordings. And they did the same thing. They said, great, you, 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 can, you can have our source code, but you'll never be able to get it on our box. Uh, so keep in mind, it's great that you might think of open source. It might not be so great that you can't use it. And this would be true also for most of your home routers. Uh, how is firmware distributed and validated? So we talked about product development. We talked about packaging. Nine times out of 10, uh, it's going to be done through a cloud or distribution service from a vendor. There's no Windows update service for this. There's no apt get, uh, go get, ABC vendor software, and there's no app store uh, for the most part, maybe for some applications now, but not for the most part. So there's kind of two cases here. Either the asset owner is going to go get it. The integrator is either going to go get it. And the integrator may also get it from the internet, right? So there might be another path where it doesn't come from an authorized source. And the asset owner might also get it from a non-authorized source. But regardless, there's often no chain of custody. So there is a big gap in processes and in automation here for security and also for the purposes of uh, understanding, you know, from point A to point B, how software got there. There's a big gap. So I'll leave that for a question for another day, but do keep in mind that there's a big gap in firmware. Just because you got firmware does not mean you know how it got there, nor the exact state it's in. And I've also never seen an integrator ever really check the hash or signature unless a tool was doing it for them and it was an enforced piece of the process. I know some people do check their hashes. I sometimes do, but I don't all the time and we're all human. Yeah, and that's one of the questions that I had or one of the things that I was going to raise, Ron, and it's, it's around exactly what you're talking about. Um, you know, with doing hash checks, there's a major gap there because no one is, no one's actually doing it. So a very, I think, uh, giving a clear example of what a typical integrator looks like within OT. So it's very clear with the picture that you have here, but can you elaborate a little bit more on what a typical integrator looks like within the OT environment, who that person is and um, you know, what policies and procedures maybe that they should be following as they are 
uh, implementing uh, an updated version of firmware in the environment because there is a lot of trust being given there. True. So, so one of the cases, often you'll have an integrator go to the cloud vendor portal and go grab a copy of the software and put it on their laptop or a file share. That's usually where the kind of the versioning part and the tracking of that chain of custody ends. Even most asset owners are the same way. They toss everything onto a file share. Maybe it's being uh, you know, monitored in a, in a file nexus. Generally, it's not. And so it's kind of a very ad hoc thing, right? Like once it goes into the integrator, it's specific to that project and maybe just the project's equipment, like the infrastructure, like a laptop. It's, it's just floating around there. And so the integrator might also be working on four or five other product or companies, not just your own as an asset owner. Mm -hmm. And so they might be wandering around with software that they obtained for another project uh, that might be out of date. And so they're like, oh, I have, I have the, I think I have the latest firmware and maybe it's out of date or they don't know how it got there. And so you're kind of posing a risk. You don't know how, you know, where that piece of software came that would wind up in your environment. Integrators often are very, uh, very loose in following process, right? They, you know, experience sometimes they're like, oh, I can cut corners here, right? I don't need to check it. Um, or it'll be fine. Uh, or they go on the first thing on internet. And I've, I've, I've been noticing that a lot of uh, companies or malicious entities, I should say, are poisoning the Google search results and putting up tampered uh, PDFs. This is going to be true for installers. I'm looking for an installer from 20 years ago or 15 years ago, and guess what? It's going to be probably be played with and, and played around with because I know I need to execute it with administrative position or permissions to install it. Best way to go get something in the environment. And most integrators, uh, I know this is stepping away from firmware, but they often, if even if there's antivirus alerts, they will disable their antivirus alerts and install that piece of software anyways. They will ignore, they will get it no matter what. It's an awareness problem and it's also a process and enforcement problem. So keep in mind, there's a big gap over here in the integrator and asset owner part in the acquisition of software and the basically the archival process of it uh, and deployment too. So there's a relationship here that I think you're starting to figure out uh, between products, firmware, and vulnerabilities. The reality is, is when we look at CVEs for the IT side of things, it's pretty straightforward. You have uh, a CVE comes out, you fix it based on a, a, some sort of criteria. In industrial, uh, a flaw, is it something a flaw that needs attention? Is it a vulnerability that leads to a security related issue? Is it both or is it neither? And often, uh, if it's a vulnerability, it probably will be left alone. If it's a flaw that affects the safety, reliability, and productivity of a process, it will be addressed differently. And so there's a difference in nomenclature. But regardless, uh, I see it as, as a product. So if you really want to think about embedded systems and, and try to protect them, you need to think about a property or an artifact. It's an artifact of construction. So a flaw or vulnerability is a property or an artifact of, of something's construction that results in non-desirable behavior, right? If it was good behavior, you probably would leave it alone. If it was bad, right, it could cause, uh, for example, the lack of connectivity to a device, um, and that would require a power cycle. I'm not gonna want that, even if necessarily the security of the devices or the process is not affected, because I have no visibility on it, I can't guarantee safety and operator control. So I'm gonna understand that issue a bit different. Now for vulnerabilities security, they're pretty straightforward. It's got a web server, I can do a bad thing. Uh, but if I'm looking at the release notes for a software update and unless you're a very diligent asset owner, which uh, some are, uh, and of course all of them try to be, generally try to be, but they, you know, there's only so much time in a day. They, a lot of the release notes have dis disclosed issues that could affect the security of the device or the state of its operation should bugs occur. And those require context of the operators and the secure, security teams and asset owner or management do not understand that. Um, I understand that security teams uh, wished for those, you know, everything to always be patched, but the operations team uh, will look at things a bit different. And if it doesn't fit the security criteria of the organization or the, the need for a fix, like, you know, an urgent fix, often it will uh, be delayed until a later date or it'll wind up in a place I call the bit bucket in heaven. So, it, without further ado, James, is there any comments on, on this? Uh, you, you work in the field, so do you see, you know, patch discussions or firmware discussions where they kind of triage and prioritize 
Absolutely. Um, yeah. So with within the field, as you know, Ron, um, the patch discussion, that's already that's already hard enough. Um, and that is all built out around policies and procedures and making sure that everyone is on the same page. Um, and, you know, one plant may be different than the next because the processes may be different, although they're the exact same company. So it's a collaborative effort. Um, and one of the things we are seeing more and more of is, uh, you know, our customers going out and actually updating firmware on specific devices. Um, in the past, our tool had been utilized to make sure that all of the devices were, were captured, all of the devices had been upgraded. Um, but now we're seeing more and more where depending on the periods of the outages that they have, um, if a plant's gonna be down for a month, a lot of times we will see where they have identified a very major vulnerability and they will plan out that work for that outage. So it, it's definitely something we're starting to see more and more of. Yeah. And, and along those same lines, uh, even if they did schedule a set of work for that outage uh, and new vulnerabilities come out between that new planning and when that outage is, those new fixes often won't make it into that work window. And so they'll be pushed and pushed and pushed. That's a really good point. <clears throat> so what kinds of vulnerabilities are there? Uh, there's from a, from a classic academia perspective, you have seven high level vulnerability families. So, Everyone seems to think about software vulnerabilities and hardware vulnerabilities. They're often combined, uh, or but they're not mutually exclusive. Do consider that they can be combinatoric and wind up together. You have network and communications vulnerabilities, and those lead to uh, communications between hardware and software or between different devices. But the one I think that everyone seems to always forget is the logic and configuration-based vulnerabilities. And if you look at IT-related uh, incidents, often they come from configuration-based. Uh, or at least your exposure of vulnerabilities comes through configuration, but also logic. They're the hardest to find. And so there's been a great effort. Uh, you have a gentleman on this call that's, that's monitoring us here, Isaiah Jones. Him and Jake Brodsky have had a big discussion about making uh, secure firmware logic. That's a big piece of this pro part of ensuring safety of firmware. Um, but you won't see that come from the vendors. That will come from the, the integrators, from the ones programming your devices and the ones that, that should be operating and reviewing changes, but they might not be. The other piece there is the configuration. So we're lucky in the industrial space that all of those VX works vulnerabilities around DHCP or even Linux's uh, you know, busy boxes of DHCP, we don't usually get. The reason why is that configuration plays a key and critical role in reducing that risk. We use static IPs, we don't use DHCP. And so that whole family of vulnerabilities uh, still exists, but it's not exploitable for the purposes of DHCP. Yeah, that and that's... It's really interesting, Ron, because it, obviously, um, depending on what you're utilizing, you can get those software and hardware vulnerabilities. But when you talk about the logic and configuration based vulnerabilities, I, I understand the challenge why they're the hardest to find. So um, and I think that you hinted at this. So standardizing configurations where you can um, would would probably be step one. And so something you said uh, around the IT configurations, the policies and procedures, whatever it may be bleeding over into the IT world or the OT world. Um, it's something we see all the time. It's like the, uh, uh, depending on the size of the company, a lot of times when there is a device needed in OT, and I'm talking about a Windows device specifically, so it's outside of the embedded side of things. Um, a lot of times that gets procured through IT. So it shows up with a base IT image, which causes it to have all kinds of insecure configuration settings, as well as a boatload of unnecessary software. And so can you elaborate a little bit more on um, standardizing configurations on embedded devices and where that's feasible? Sure, sure. So, I mean, most of the time, uh, site owners or their field guys and, and ladies will go get uh, a device off the stock, right? They might go buy a ABC NAT router or XYZ PLC, and that XYZ PLC has a web server on it. They don't often look to, and it, this is actually the integrator's fault too, is they're there to do a job that's a specified scope. Usually it doesn't include turn off uh, unnecessary services, turn off this, uh, make sure that the password's not a default password. So for every type of device and every type of vendor, I think it's hard to do a standardized configuration. But what I do think that is very possible is you can do a standardized security questionnaire 
And that questionnaire and that you know, statement of procedure of SOP will guide that process to secure those devices. It won't eliminate certain things. You'll still have organizational vulnerabilities and, and you, know, you can't stop people from being people, right? But what you can do is guide a better security process uh, overall, and that will ultimately uh, help improve the bar of security across your organization. It won't reduce the risk or the threat, but what it will do is it'll help uh, improve uh, your risk for software vulnerabilities and, and those that are for communications over wires or even physical ones. So that's a, that's a very interesting part there as well. Got it. Um, there's also a relationship there of most integrators and vendors just getting the, the manuals for, you know, how do I configure a device done? They always forget there's often secure uh, supplementary, you know, secure deployment supplemental uh, documentation. No one's enforcing them to go do it and no one's checking to see if the, the integrator that did it properly during uh, CSAPS testing, which is cybersecurity site assessments. Nobody's checking to see that last part um, in most cases. So there is an intrinsic relationship there on how, how you apply a device and that onus is on you. Um, just like when you drive a car, a car is reasonably safe if you drive it safely, but uh, if you drive it you know, on, at Mach 10 under very terrible conditions, that's on you, that's not on the car. So I don't wanna bury everyone in the types of vulnerabilities, but I wanna focus on something called rote learning. Um, I have got a big background of working with special needs. And what I've learned is they often, the, men, the, me, the way that they, they memorize things is in buckets. Um, so for example, if my sister sees a, a cake, it doesn't mean it's a celebration. It's immediately a birthday. She sees a birthday. She also thinks of presents and all of the things that go around it. It's in a bucket. So when you're looking at vulnerabilities, you want to understand the language. And the language, you don't need to know the, the, the bits and the bytes. You need to understand what the high level, what's going on. So I'm, gonna, I'm not trying to cherry pick on any vendor. That's why I chose a bunch here. Most vulnerabilities are lack of due diligence by vendors to do things like remove debug interfaces. Uh, if you have a web server, do a web, make sure the web server is good. Like you write a web app, there's so much in, in documentation around it, but you'll see a bunch of web related vulnerabilities. Clear text transmission of sensitive secrets, uh, basically a forever day vulnerability that will always be there, but only usable under certain conditions, right? Not everyone logs into a telnet, uh, logs in telnet on a router on a frequent basis. So your risk of exposure of those secrets can be very minimal in some cases because these plants are very steady state. A lot of vulnerabilities you'll see is around proprietary ICS protocols resulting in unexpected or anomalous conditions. Again, there's multiple layers in front of that that reduce the residual risk to a level that you are comfortable with as an organization. It doesn't mean that that vulnerability is necessarily exploitable. It might be an option that's not enabled on that device or not available in that, free, that, in that firmware. So keep that in mind that you want to bucket certain things. So when you see things like specially crafted packets, you know to add a certain layer of network protection. Resource consumption, that's not necessarily security, that's more of a safety and reliability problem. I don't want my device to not be responding when I need it to be responding. And then you have others um, that are related to other infrastructure that isn't necessarily used. It's part of the stack, so DHCP. You have these buckets. And so there's, you'll often will see these type of six uh, vulnerabilities. And so out of these, Ron, out of these six vulnerabilities, um, you know, which, which ones on this page would you consider to be the most common in OT? Um, obviously, I know there are, there are web servers with an OT, but it's, it's more of a rarity. Um, so as far as embedded systems go, really, what should, uh, what should an asset owner or someone trying to st stand up a better security posture be more focused on when we talk about these common types of vulnerabilities? Right. So if I was to, to be a betting person, right, let's say I wound up with a swamp of vulnerabilities. That's kind of what we jokingly call it. it the reason why you might see more web uh, related vulnerabilities is because there's tons of automation uh, scripting and application software out there that tests for these conditions. It's, it's the poor man's type of vulnerability. When you see researchers poking, post, posting nothing about web beta vulnerabilities, it's a low hanging fruit for them to go get CVs to their name for. The real tricky ones uh, that really separate the experts uh, from the ones that are looking at this for this for, 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 you know, for glory and for fame are the ones that are looking at the embedded ones, right? The ones that are like, if you do this thing in the stack, it will result in a, in a, a halt condition. Those are the ones that I find particularly concerning. Um, and often 
there's a bunch of reasons around that, but for the most part, those ones really affect my safety and reliability versus a web web server one I'm probably going to be less concerned about because you know I can potentially disable that functionality, but I can't disable the ICS network stack. So those ones I'll be concerned about. And same with the resource consumption. It's, I look at it from a safety or reliability perspective, not so much the CIA triad. Got it. So it's more of a criticality thing. Criticality Absolutely. as far as what, what the purpose of the abs what the purpose of that asset is. Okay. Correct. Correct. And you might all, like I said earlier, you might have the same PLC, uh, you know, from the same vendor with the same vulnerabilities, but it's deployed in a totally different place, right? It's off in the corner of someone's office controlling, I don't know, the light switch. Well, that really isn't that bad, but I might have the same PLC somewhere else that's controlling relays for an emergency stop function. And so that, uh, that device, you wouldn't know without tribal knowledge. Uh, and to add that knowledge to the way that you're doing your risk calculations and prioritization, you need to have that. And so these advisories, again, are, are a piece of information and you need to have adequate input on your own. And I'm sure Isaiah is going to be nodding his head and doing fist pumps. <laughs> so I think this is another fun one as well. You have, when you look at the pie of all the vulnerabilities here, uh, is blame equally distributed in an insecure environment? Is it weighted or is it biased? Who's the cause here? You would be right to argue the component supplier is usually the one at, at fault, uh, but usually they're the one that get a, gets away with it. Um, and the real blame, kind of the one who wears the mud on their face is the OEMs uh, because they may or may not fix a product. But the one who has to live with it, all of those decisions, I know from the upstream of this, um, assuming that the OEM even did a, a provided a fix altogether, because the component supplier often is fixing the stuff that is being reported, but the OEMs are integrating it uh, for a variety of reasons. The asset owners are the ones that wear the mud on their face. Now, why is that? Well, part of that comes down to software engineering. The OEMs aren't doing a great job in testing all of their software. And the more complicated their firmware gets, the harder it is for them to mean, uh, keep a product secure, but also to keep it uh, viable from a financial standpoint. So again, you've got to keep in mind, they are in the business to make money and they integrate a bunch of things. They may miss pieces. Um, and often software is not well engineered. They're not engineering out the risk. And the asset owners are not engineering out the risk of any vulnerability. So this pie, depending on where you are sitting in it, uh, may, may look different and may be shifted. But I think the asset owners need some help, but they also need to help themselves. And so, Ron, when you talk about um, who wears the mud on their face, how do you see it progressing in the, in the future for the responsibility continuing to fall further towards the vendor? And the reason that I ask that is because with, with all of these environments that we work within, um, a large number of them are regulated and they have to follow certain, um, certain regulations to make sure that they, they are secure um, so what do you see in the near future as far as more of this actually landing on the vendor? So immediately right now, I'm seeing more language for security showing up in like, you know, proposals for projects. Um, I think, and I think that's great. And you're, you're seeing more management being aware of the risk and they actually are liable for it in many cases. So you're seeing more of that plus the compliance. What I think will be the major stepping stone in holding, let's say, OEMs accountable will be for the asset owners to start legal lawsuits against the OEM for not implementing updates on, on certain terms. Or maybe they've done had le legal language that says, I will provide updates for the next seven years of that product, but they only do two. And you can, you can prove, especially with bill of materials, you can prove that, that that OEM is not updating the Linux kernel or updating something. Then there's going to be a very interesting court case that I'm sure will arise probably out of the United States first, or maybe Europe. Uh, and, and so that will start to change that relationship. Uh, I also think there will be a change in the way that component suppliers and OEMs interact. So there might be more service support contracts and the OEMs and security, I think, will also improve over time as hardware becomes uh, vanillaized, as I say. It's, uh, you wind up with more designs that are closer to the mainline operating system. And as, as that continues, you'll find that patches should get faster and faster or firmware updates because they don't have to backport or forward port patches uh, from a newer version and backwards. So there will be some changes as we move forward. And as, uh, so open source has had a dent in that, um, but that will all, but I think that's the way it's going to go. I, I don't have the right answer necessarily on where the mud will land uh, tomorrow, but I think the asset owners unfortunately are, are the ones that are wearing it today and they're getting frustrated. <laughs> 
Interesting. Yeah. And I, I fully agree. And one of the things, one of the questions that I have is around um, th that responsibility because it, it typically starts with the asset owner, right? It, it generally, to me, it starts with the asset owner um, where they find a specific vulnerability maybe. Um, and so what, what do you think about these asset owners today? Because typically when we see them, they, they just don't have enough time for things like this. And so what do you think the process is for them to be able to go to their boss or to management to talk around the different policies and procedures, the process, the tools needed to be put in place to actually um, remediate these vulnerabilities if the vendors ever get to a point where they are providing updated, vulner, you know, updated images, updated firmware images on a regular basis um, what do you think the best way for, for an asset owner is to go to management and say, this is what we need and this is why we need it, given their limited amount of time? True. So I think you need to have a good understanding of, of the basics, right? If you don't have an understanding of the basics, you won't be able to have a very good discussion with management. Uh, I think it's a, it's a forklift problem. You need, you need to understand, uh, and some vendors are working around that problem by saying, if you buy my, my SIS, you need to put uh, a deep pack inspection firewall in front of it. Guess what? You don't get to buy our product until you buy the DPI firewall that we're talking about. Um, so it, there is that potential approach on dealing with those things for those types of issues. I, I don't know the right answer right now on how that will be addressed right now, James, but I do believe that a firm, uh, the, a firm understanding and handle on the basics and having good communication will help you get to a point where you can talk to the boss and say, this is a risk because I can do this on this system, right? That's a key function of understanding your risks and doing detailed assessments. That's why you do those type of things for systems under consideration. It's it's a very deep and complex project, um, and I'll hopefully get to talk to that near the end of this. So I'll try to pick up the pace a bit. Okay. So I think this is kind of what you're alluding to, uh, you know, looking at this, right? So this is a well-known, a relatively recent uh, Rockwell a and &E Flex Card for I.O. It's got a bunch of network vulnerabilities that are related to an ICS protocol. They're born through the network. Well, guess what? Uh, it's very rare that someone on Shodan can get direct access to a PLC. If you do, you've got bigger problems. Uh, you don't have the basics under control. You don't have firewalls. You have port ruling, and your site is doing whatever it wishes. Um, you might even be want to be more concerned about the human beings on your site uh, for their safety, but also for the fact that they're being negligent and could be held liable. Uh, generally speaking, most of the time, it takes multiple things to get into your environment. So when we're talking about a firmware vulnerability, you say, okay, that's great, but what, like, when, you, when, a, when a plane crashes, they don't just say the plane crashed, uh, it, it's Boeing's fault. No, it's what were the pilots doing? What was the training? What was the software loadout? Yeah, planes actually have software loadout that, load that are not from Boeing, for example. What is all of that? And so it's not as simple as having uh, malicious software get to a device. Direct access is rare. There's multiple steps in that chain. Now, what I would be concerned about, though, is not the PLC per se in this case. I would be concerned about the HMI that could issue those commands because it's in a privileged position that could talk to those PLCs. I would be concerned about the endpoints because the endpoints are largely where the attackers are present. They're not present on the PLCs. They're present on the commodity boxes and the Cisco routers, for example. That's where they will be. And so that's where I, I look at this as this is a larger discussion. And so if you're looking for OT vulnerabilities, Look, you know, it's, it's shopping cart theory, right? If you're looking for your friend at the grocery store, chances are they're in the longest lineup. Uh, they're not in the shortest one. So look, look, look to those systems first. Yeah, and I think this one's really interesting, Ron, because of some of the things that you pointed out. You know, when we look at different vulnerabilities for some of the devices, um, one specifically, a, a DDoS attack where um, sending, a, sending a ping packet to uh, controller in a specific fashion can actually cause that and it has a low attack complexity. Um, so I think that what you're highlighting here on the right hand side is the importance of network segmentation because while that vulnerability may be easier to exploit, um, you would have to exploit multiple. Uh, so exploiting a vulnerability through the firewall and then through a switch to get all the way down to that, um, that layer one device uh, to expose that that very simple uh, vulnerability. 
Yeah, and it's all context. I mean, we're looking at this from the network side, but you know, Joe Blow could walk up with a laptop right up to it and plug in a programming card to it or a programming uh, interface to it. So there's also that vector too. But you know, from the network side, it's not just as simple as getting access to it. It's it's much more as a, as you're saying. And I do recognize we are coming up a little bit on time. We started slower and we're having some meaningful discussions. So this, this will be recorded uh, and we'll, we will be able to distribute it. But what I think some of you are looking for is the juicy stuff, which is where we're getting to now. And I had to settle out the base case of understanding vulnerabilities. So I apologize for the quality of these screenshots. Uh, it turns out ARM changed their uh, EULA. And so I couldn't go back and, and use a new copy of their PDF. This is related to an ARM A7 chip. And what's interesting about it is everyone forgets that there's hardware conditions in different revisions of the same chips. So when you go buy, uh, let's say an Intel i7 CPU of X type of model SKU, you, if you've ever looked at the die, the basically the silk screening on top of it, you'll recognize that there's a bunch of revisions on it. And the, some of those can be software like bytecode that's embedded into them or it's physical, right? There's different types of uh, revisions and batches. But in this one particular case, you have a vulnerability. I don't know the ARM nomenclature per se, but there's a load or store condition that check that might cause a deadlock or data corruption between two different buses. And so if we look again uh, at the detailed part of it, you can see there's this new, I'm starting to point you towards, there's a nuanced effect on what something might actually apply to. So when you go say that you are reporting a vulnerability to your latest cert, they have to go figure this out, this metric or this matrix, sorry. So what you want, what in this case, this vulnerability applies to all of these different revisions of chips. And this one down here, which is a category B, I'm not sure which it is, but it's not available in that latest one. So it seems that they did some sort of change uh, either to fix it or they removed that functionality or, or just it was never available. So keep in mind that vulnerabilities are bigger, but I guarantee you very few of you, unless you've worked in hardware, have ever heard of errata uh, being security related. But you, this is another case where if someone is smart enough, you can want, or smart enough, or or curious enough, or has enough time, they can wind make your device wind up in a condition you never expected it to wind up in. Want a prime example? This happened March twentieth this year. Uh, so it's not just Boeing that has issues with their airplanes, and it's not just pick your vendor. Uh, there was a Rockwell Collins unit on a Bombardier CRJ. Maybe they picked this up because there's not that many planes filing flying these days, but. A plane missed its landing by 29 miles on its approach. Well, that's a pretty scary thing. That's a safety related thing that could have wound up with pilots being unaware uh, and maybe under poor visibility conditions, driving that plane into the ground, literally. Or it could wind up in a collision with another aircraft. And it's related to uh, how the hardware and the software are configured. So when the te automatic temperature compensation uh, is being activated uh, during certain conditions, the plane will not behave properly. It may actually reduce, uh, or it will alter the procedure defined for, for example, the way it tur you turn onto your, onto your process. And, th and that's why I wanna talk about this is that there's certain conditions where hardware and software can work together, or you might have a, a, you know, a, a large PLC rack with a back plane. And then if you put the cards in a certain order, that may affect uh, the performance of that system in ways that you never thought about. So if you think about some of the older uh, IT-based networking systems where you could stack uh, Cisco Catalyst switches and do an SNMP poll. Well, you remember that if you, the, if you hit a certain number of, of uh, systems that were basically daisy chained together, then it would just be, you would be missing data or it would be too slow or it wouldn't work at all. So keep in mind that interactions of, of things and whether or not it's from the same vendor or other vendors might wind up in a situation that affects the safety and reliability of the process. And that usually happens when you're dealing with very specific uh, embedded systems that have that are there to do a functional uh, that have a very specific functional purpose. So talking about my buckets, uh, you need, investigation and reduction sounds pretty complex, but the truth of it is, it's not. When you hear watchdog, you need to think about there's something that watches this the system to see if it's if it's basically stuck in a loop, right? It's hanging. It usually, it will reboot it interrupts. That's related to an IO on a CPU. Like, are you interrupting the processing on it? Uh, because there's an emergency condition, right? Like someone pressed the big red button. Uh, that can wind up in a case where you wind up with resource starvation or a crash. Kernel module. Uh, if you're running something in Linux, chances are you'll think of it for execution of code or denial of service. Bootloader. 
only it's it's only accessible under certain conditions. So when that system is booting or you have physical access to it, that is when you can go after a bootloader. You can't do it when you're in a steady state machine. Big hint there. That's why you want you. That's why you make sure you track your firmware revisions on devices. You pull it regularly, but you also make sure that no one has physical access so they can do an unverified load. Right. This is not necessarily network born, but it's under certain conditions. Compromised bootloader code means compromised system if someone is has the skill and also the the will to do it. Buses. If you hear something about USB I2C, yes, there's a physical aspect to it. Generally, it's about resource issues. Uh, hinted about firmware verification is just bad. If you're not doing it, it's bad for several reasons. One is it might not be malicious, but some uh, there's been a bit flip somewhere between uh, you know it's been transferred on three or four integrators' laptops, and you're winding up with a firmware that is not what the vendor specified or provided officially. SD cards, JTAG, serials, it might expose you to a physical attack. Keep that in mind. Serial may also expose you to networking based attacks where you often will see, oh, that device is serial. Uh, no one can attack it. Uh, actually, you might because nine times out of 10, there's a TCP uh, to serial gateway in front of it. So you have those, those type of side channel style attacks. Um, again, the ICS protocol, well, that's going to affect the process. So protect it. Um, what in all of the forms that that is, right? You shouldn't just be protecting the asset, but you need to be making the, the necessary concern. So I like to think in buckets. Um, and, you know, I, I even do drawings such as this one here where I looked at, you know, this is an IoT widget to control my temperature in my house. This is kind of how it works. Um, you don't need to know the bits and the bytes and be an electrical engineer, but it does help to think of things in this term of like code blocks or hardware blocks. And that will kind of uh, spur your discussion when you're looking at these things. So last but not least, before I jump into the remediation part, uh, the good news. Presence of vulnerability does not mean exploitability. Relevancy is affected through a bunch of conditions. Configuration, implementation, and usage. So every vendor doesn't necessarily tell you how those things are there. Here's an example. When you compile a Linux kernel, I could configure to have certain ARM errata, right? Those are, that's referring to that form earlier uh, of disabling that type of uh, functionality, or it enables a workaround in software. Therefore, kind of mitigating the hardware vulnerability. Same with the kernel one. You can, and you can have modules that are loadable, but they're not compiled into the kernel. Those also make an easier update as well for the vendor. Here's another one that most people know. Most people were not vulnerable to heart bleed despite the numbers that were reported. The reason being, most of the systems did not actually have open SSL heartbeats enabled into them, especially the embedded stuff. The web servers may be more so because they're, they're, it was part of the default package manager's configuration when they compiled those binaries. But embedded, everyone's like, I don't need open SSL, no heartbeats. Like, I just don't need it. So they, they manage a bit different. Same with Urgent 11 and VxWorks. Urgent 11 and VxWorks and Trek. As you know, it's been very hard to actually see the extent of those vulnerabilities being actually applied. If you look at uh, Rockwell's advisory on which products are affected for either one of these, it's not all 11 or all of the vulnerabilities in each one of those categories. Uh, it's actually a matrix of this one applies, that one doesn't. It's on this product, not on that one. It's very, very specific. So that's the good news. You can't blanket it. It's not like an RDP vulnerability in Windows that's everywhere all at once. This is very distinct uh, characteristic for each of those uh, embedded systems. And I'm just going to double check my questions. Uh, generating a lot of requests from OT to open access divided by OEMs. Oh boy, um, that's a huge discussion. I'm, I want to have lots of discussions that we can actually give you some uh, extra material on that if you wish, or you can contact me and I'll have a chat with you. Uh, same with the gentleman discussing uh, about Shodan uh, with James as well. So I'm hoping to follow up with a bunch of blogs on this. How to assess and protect embedded systems with or without vulnerabilities. I assume they all have vulnerabilities. I assume my car is gonna go into a snowbank at some point in Canada. It happens. Uh, that's just a fact of life. The idea is to reduce that risk of me going in a snowbank or someone else putting me in a snowbank or hitting me. That's the real, that's the real money maker. So what I recommend everyone, this is gonna look familiar to anyone that knows 62443. Uh, this is kind of a way that I look at doing these type of processes on it. So I start with a target or a candidate, right? And I know there's a question about, well, uh, can how do I set up a lab? I have very rarely ever seen a company with a dedicated test lab. Why? Well, because it costs a lot of money. Um, 
if you think that uh, a PLC is expensive at five or ten thousand dollars or thirty thousand dollars, you've never seen a DCS. A DCS, some of them go start start at a half a million dollars for the most basic version. So you're not going to have a spare, unfortunately. I wish you could, you could, but you won't. Um, you might be able to piece one together over time, uh, but the older it gets, the more expensive it gets, especially if it was a widespread product, uh, or also too if it's a niche product, they get very expensive. So. Ideally, you want to pick something that's uh, represent, representational if you're choosing to do a live, large, uh, live environment, but lower risk initially. So let's, let's use an example of, of a relay or a protective relay. I'm going to pick kind of my favorite uh, frameworks based on what it is. So if I chose to go the web application developer framework, I'll pick something like OWASP or for the automation frameworks or the things I'm looking for. Or I might even look at things from a 62443 perspective. What are the interfaces that I'm looking at? What are the risks? Uh, look at stuff like that, right? How is this device going to be used in the field? And I'm going to gather as much data before I start poking at it. And there's a bunch of means to do it, and I'll talk more about that. But I, ultimately, I'm going to look at it at a high level. I'll identify a risk. Is there a solution? Should there be one? Uh, I'll look to either you know, deploy it on the device. So for example, SNMP version 1 and version 2C have vulnerabilities in clear text uh, transmission of secrets. For example, version three is available on that device and it's a very, very low uh, effort, assuming that you're in a period of shutdown to go configure those devices for version three. So I can identify a fix and I can protect it in those regards through a configuration mechanism. As long as I have the right support and I follow the change controls. I'm gonna implement those solutions and should I be able to, um, I'm gonna adjust, you know, adjust my metrics for modeling the residual risk. I'm gonna state my responsibility in the matter and we'll record any decisions that come out of it. And maybe we don't do anything about those devices, but we might also consider that we record those things in a risk register, which 90% of organizations are not doing properly today. Maybe because nobody likes owning risk uh, at a personal basis or having their names on things, but that is a key thing that needs to change. It's, it's a positive thing. It's not a finger pointing game. And so I start with a high level process to, to garner that type of information. When you look at firmware vulnerabilities, this is, this is how I do it. And you have to be very careful when someone says, I want to go set up a lab and poke at things. How many are you prepared to go tell your boss you bricked a PLC? If any one of you was on the CS3 uh, conference recently and you heard about you know, them decapping and working, and working a Schneider electric controller into the ground, what you don't know is that they failed 20, I think they broke 26 or 28 PLCs. And they also had different hardware revisions also in them. And that was the part that wasn't mentioned in that discussion. But you can easily brick these devices. So you need to know with uh, tactical and surgical skills, you don't just broadly go apply a vulnerability scanner at a PLC because you might wind up in a case where you brick it. For example, I once bricked a WAGO by using NITCA against it. It didn't matter. It was one of our spare units that was dirt cheap. But I bricked it to the point the bootloader didn't work. And we sent it back to the manufacturer and told them it was dead on arrival. That's what you need to be aware of. So what you do is you select a candidate uh, testing where you look at, you know, alert and you find a candidate device. You build this profile of information around it. And you might do that through some testing, right? Okay, uh, a very simple targeted ping suite. Uh, you might look at it, hey, is Telnet open? Okay, um, so you log it, try to log in with Telnet. Or you look at FTP. You look at very targeted things. And that is a very different approach than ping sweeping or, or port scanning the device. It's I send one packet, did I get something back? I did this, I wait, I see if it comes back. And if you're monitoring it with an HMI or something that a uh, diagnostic tool that's looking at, let's say the CPU usage or the memory usage of that device, that's how you should be doing it. And I would recommend the same if you're doing that on a, on a cloud ser or a server for selling tickets for something or you know, uh, Google Ma Google's probably watching their instrumentation, uh, which is no different than how we would look at these systems. Um, you want to look at information that you see inside of it. So if you have an SSH shell, check out to see if it's running BusyBox. Oh, it's running BusyBox. I'm going to take all of that information, the versions around that. I'm going to look for things like what CPU is this? Uh, is there leftovers from the manufacturer, like the board support package, a BSP? And I'm going to cross-reference that to a Linux thing called LXR. And I'm going to form a bunch of hypotheses. And I'm leaving out hardware for a reason here. Now, you're going to test those hypotheses. You might do that with tools and fuzzers if you can afford a loss of that device. Uh, you might do it by doing very intelligent usage of Wireshark and the OAM tools. And you're going to build your discussions about those vulnerabilities or the, those flaws that can put the device into a condition where it's unsafe and specifically related to those vulnerabilities. 
if you have the skill, the time, the want, you can probe the hardware. So often there's a, a UART or a serial uh, port there that's left on the board. And the reason being is a lot of that stuff is very, very expensive to change after you go into manufacturing. Often uh, hardware tests are very tricky to do and very expensive, right? You don't just go send a board into manufacturing and, and hope for the best on your first run. It never works that way. Uh, you might do five, 10, and the more the longer you get into your cycles and the more tests you do and, and the bigger those batches, well, small batches are very expensive, but the bigger the batches, that also gets expensive because you need to recycle components and stuff like that from the product side. So you'll often will see test points and those type of debugging interfaces left on those devices uh, Either, you know, maybe the pins won't be here, but you can go solder them on yourself. There, there is ways to do that in probes. Um, now, some of the new modern chip designs make that very hard, but that's, that's in a nutshell how I find vulnerabilities uh, through this general process. I make a very surgical bet before I start probing certain things. So if I know protocol is direct memory mapping and, and chances are it's running on, uh, let's say, a 2.4 Linux kernel or something like that, I know there's nothing that's going to stop me from wandering off uh, in another section of memory. So I do uh, take very, very careful and measured guesses when I'm trying to find vulnerabilities. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell that again. If you're an asset owner and you're, you specifically do not have the skills to probe hardware and cannot afford the loss of it, don't do it unless you look at all of the information around its usage and you monitor it appropriately. Timestamp. And that's how, I, that's how I look at those type of systems. Uh, oh, we're really approaching the end here. So how are those vulnerabilities remediated? Well, first we make some big assumptions about the configs and updates. We assume there's a more secure option. Then we investigate our options. We identify our relevant candidates. And someone's gonna say, well, how do I scan them for vulnerabilities? You need to look at all of the information. Chances are the CPEs do not match what's for those vendors, right? You might see CVE, uh, blah, blah, blah for VxWorks. But you need to go to the vendor page and you need to go check what you have as your asset inventory that's accurate and cross-reference that to the versions and discussions that are going on with the vendors. Right now, today, there is no tool that maps that properly unless you're buying a specialized service from a vendor. Um, and even then, I would recommend that maybe pur purchasing all the services from, let's say, the, the company that makes that PLC might not be the right answer either. Um, it's, it's a bigger discussion that you need to be on the ball for. You, you, can't, you can't trust them just to do everything. You need to trust but verify. You look for change things in the change logs for language that matches any reported or similar vulnerabilities. So I know that on a Bentley Nevada, uh, there's a there's not a vulnerability per se, but there's a note in well, the language for a version that's long since big, been fixed, but is under for two small revisions, that if you instantiate a second connection on their configuration card, it will kill the service. And so the only way to get it back would be to restart the Bentley Nevada. Well. That's not gonna fly in a plant where Bentley Nevada often can control the whole plant and it will trip uh, the whole plant because it thinks it's a big issue. So you need to be very careful and look for things that are not specifically cybersecurity related that will wind up with you losing your job or a loss or dis uh, disruption or whatever. You need to be very, very targeted for that. And if you can get around all that, you'll select your candidates and, your, and do whatever changes are there for things that are known not to cause further issues. And we will apply it at the right time, during a downtime, with appropriate change management, with rollback plans, with backups. You will do those things in the right order, at least for the initial ones, because you need to build up trust and confidence in your model. But that sounds too easy, right? I know it's very feasible, you can do it, but it does sound too easy, doesn't it? So, the reason why if, if patches were available, uh, or let's say they weren't in this case, right? And I think this is where James will probably jump in here. So maybe James, you wanna maybe talk about how, what can you do when someone says, I don't want you to patch or maybe a patch doesn't exist for a known vulnerability? Yeah, yeah. And it, it's all around the what you were just saying about making sure that you understand the device well enough to be touching it. Are you willing to lose that device? Can you lose that device? So while I said in certain scenarios, we are seeing customers that are actually updating the firmware within the OT environment, there are definitely other scenarios where they don't have the experience. Um, you, you may not have the experience, you may not have the right person in place to be able to do things like that. And in those scenarios, we focus specifically on mitigation and it's, it's what you had mentioned, Ron. And what this drawing points out of um, what we're talking about as far as mitigation goes, 
I think there is a very real misconception around thinking that things like firewalls and islanded networks make devices secure. And the reason that I say that is because you can easily, what we see a lot of times is, although a, although a network may be islanded, yes, it's not gonna get a virus from the rest of the plant network, um, but what happens when that system actually does need some sort of software update, firmware update, whatever it may be? Nine times out of 10, it's a contractor's laptop being plugged into that network. And I think that Ron's drawing here highlights it very well. Um, so it's all about having that mitigation in place and making sure you have the correct policies and procedures around the people that are actually plugging into your network. A lot of times we see where we go into plants and we're not allowed to wear our phone or our watches, uh, take our phones, uh, especially not our laptops onto the plant floor for this reason specifically. Um, one of the things, Ron, that you could maybe elaborate on that you mentioned the other day was, you know, someone dropping a special cable in a parking lot for an iPhone. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I walk into a plant and see, um, see an iPhone plugged into an HMI solely so it can charge. Yeah, so that's that. So you off, maybe some of you can have a homework exercise there. There's the it's called an OMG or Oh My God cable, and it, it mimics uh, basically a rubber ducky. It looks like a charging cable to the computer, but it does issue uh, Bluetooth low energy signals. And so if someone has control of it, they can turn it into basically a rubber ducky, uh, which will it will basically open a shell and fire commands into it over the USB bus. It pretends it's a keyboard. It can it can swap roles. So those type of vulnerabilities are something to take in mind. And, and there's also another piece here as we get, and I'm, and I'm leaving out sensors and, and the risks on those two. I don't want to get into it. Uh, we're talking purely from the, from the networking and, and these type of vulnerabilities. But as I said, uh, attacker presence uh, is, if you look at the left-hand side of this diagram where the house is and the internet cloud, that's where most of your vulnerabilities are in the orange. And those are the ones that are more likely to be attacked first because of your exposure. So if you're doing patching, uh, programs on things uh, and mitigations and, and hardening of configurations, focus here. I'll give you a hint. Trisis attacks started there. They started on the servers and they started with misconfiguration of VPNs and started misconfiguration of firewalls. You can reduce that, the risk to get to that green zone where the PLCs are that are highly vulnerable, whether you know disclosed or not, you're reducing the chances before you can get there. So in this case, I'll use cars as an example, uh, driving again in the winter. This is uh, the case where I have good winter tires, insurance, and I drive slow. If I do those things, chances are I'm not gonna wind up in a crash. And so the chance for an attacker is gonna be far less for them to get to this intermediary zone. The idea is, is to impl implement as many technologies, and pro well, not, the, the, not as many, the, the right technologies and the right processes to identify indicators of something that is anomalous. I won't say compromised, but anomalous uh, events earlier on and trying to prevent uh, good people from doing bad things. So here's another case. We bought a pack off of the internet. Guess what? It had a Bitcoin miner on the FTP server for it. Did anyone ever think to buy, uh, especially if you're in a, in a very cost sensitive environment like nowadays with you know, Cove ID, you're gonna go buy used equipment or maybe your control system is very old and it's running some sort of VxWorks that guaranteed has a default uh, Telnet on or, or FTP server. Did you ever think to scan it before you installed your logic on it and deployed in the field? I ch chances are you didn't. You thought you'd crash it. So maybe you should at least pull out the SD card, put in your own SD card and, and check the files on it first. Um, that's, that's another way, right? I could bypass this whole loop and get there. The other piece is um, often you'll see laptops in, in those environments uh, swapping between the zones. So even if you had good network hygiene, uh, those portable, I call them crash carts uh, from the aviation industry, but those crash carts, right? When reservations breaks, they come out of the woodwork and they're not patched or they're bouncing around. Worry about those guys. And then ultimately, I don't just want to think about the systems that are affected, like I said earlier, for the EN, uh, for the Flex IO cards. I also want to consider that HMI there. So risk will, you know, attacker presence will decrease uh, the, the closer you get to that green zone. But when an attacker does get there, the risk and the impact and the likelihood of their success increases immensely, right? That, you know, from end to end, the risk is lo low in a good environment for them to get there. But once they get there, the risk and impact of something, uh, especially if they know what they're doing, will increase and so, so will your cost, especially if they have insider knowledge. And I guess the real question that everyone's gonna say is, okay, so how do I protect my embedded systems with a multiple set of layered controls? And I think that's the best way to look at it. 
So my key six takeaways from this, uh, and thanks for everyone for staying on for those that have, uh, it's not all gloom. If you control the environment, you control the risk. If you assume vulnerable assets are present connected and connectivity is easily obtained, then you're in trouble if, if, you don't, if you don't manage that condition. We wanna add controls to isolate, monitor and secure these systems by engineering out the consequence with respect to the realities. Security is in the detail for the owners. I, I can't say that enough. It's up to you to be monitoring the disclosure feeds, the portals, or, or have a source that is doing that uh, with a super high SLA and verify it, hold them to it. Um, you know, maybe they may not be always right and on time, but at least that'll help you get a good uh, a thumbs up indicator of how I'm, how I'm doing and you know what risks I need to go to the board, especially when the board comes knocking. Asset and change management is key. If you track your assets and track what they have, you can make educative decisions, right? So if someone says, I'm gonna put in a new PLC today, your change management says, did you harden it? Did you change the default password? And if they say no, or there's that next verification step in your change management process before that you know goes uh, gets let go, and they find out that the, the password's uh, company one two three or the default for that device admin password, then then that you fall you fall on, fallen on yourself. Again, enforce security more with C, CFATs and CSAPs. Test before installation, after installation, and continue. It's also an ongoing maintenance activity for your organization and security continually degrades or rots over time. So you need to manage that. Think again and have process. So it's not just about uh, patching an ad hoc. Oh, I, I happen to see an email from my OEM. No, you need to have the right providence and, and the governance around how do you deal with these things? Do the procedures address uh, certain things? Do they have training around it? Uh, when a device breaks, typically everyone just takes it out and grabs another out of storage. Maybe you put it aside and then you do memory forensics on it or, or ship it back to manufacturer with respect to understanding what else has happened on your instant in your organization that day. You need to think ahead. It's, and, and you're going to need to think ahead if you wish to have cybersecurity insurance. I hate to tell you, this will be a big upcoming play moving forward. And the last piece, defense in depth. Uh, relying on device specific controls and local segmentation is enough. We need physical controls, run, you know, turn the run keys to off, secure your Windows boxes, secure your user accounts, your third parties, monitor for them for doing things that they shouldn't be through your, through your VPN tunnels, or if they put in their own LTE uh, assets that bypass your controls, uh, look for, secure those OEM applications. They always have tons of vulnerabilities. So do proper application security. Yeah, there's so, there's so much there that, that you can do. And, and so, um, it's a multi-layered approach. Uh, I'm laughing here, the one disable USB ports. I like hot glue. Hot glue is a great one to keep people honest. You can at least remove it if you need to. Um, often you do that for cabling, right? To stop it from moving so it's not a big of a threat, assuming that you can use hot glue in your environments, of course. Uh, there's, there's, a, there's a variety of controls that you can do and it's all based on your risk appetite and people need to stop thinking of security as a cost sink, but security is also uh, an enabler of business which allows you to generate revenue. So that, that's kind of my notes on there. Um, thank you for everyone for standing along. I realize we, we ran over by quite some time, uh, but the recording will be available. Any other questions that maybe we should answer? Um, so I see there's a question from Thomas. Uh, so get, we were getting lots of requests from OT departments to open access for OEMs using TeamViewer and all sorts of wonderful things. Uh, direct reverse published ports, yeah, of course. Uh, definitely not accept accessible or acceptable. So one of the ways I recommend to try and act as a way of control for that would be, uh, A, you need to, so there's multiple layers here. One is you need to control the point of ingress. Uh, and that point of ingress is also an endpoint that you need to patch and secure and often it will have firmware, right? It might be a Cisco uh, VPN uh, terminal or Robert, so you have that, you have that. That's one layer that secures your connection in. You might have a, have a uh, MFA plus credentials, whatever. Then from that point, once you have the VPN, you establish a connection through that VPN to a very, very secure jump box. Like it might be a Citrix server. And that you control again, the user, another maybe batch of users and policies, uh, maybe another batch of credentials maybe, um, or like an MFA, a token. And basically that is your other point to stop anyone to get into the environment. You monitor between the VPN and there very, very strictly and all of the users accesses. That will help 
secure the conduits and, and also secure the way that you're talking between zones and the assets between them. So, uh, you know, let's say it's myself, right? If I'm only authorized to program that batch of PLCs because that's what's in my scope of my contract, I have a user account that can only talk to those assets, IPs. Um, that's the way to do it. It's not be like, oh yeah, well, third parties here. Uh, yeah, the SIS is connected, go for it. Um, no, you only limit things there and you make sure that the site owners are also aware of the cybersecurity concerns. Very rarely do I have I've met a site owner that is capable enough or at least aware of the right things, the right questions to ask to understand that I might be Im implicating their, their, you know, their optimal uh, success for that day, right? So if I could be affecting their batch process or I could be affecting their safety and, and those site owners also have to have a, an earnest there to kind of protect it. So my argument would be, if you don't want to play by our rules uh, and then you don't, then you don't come in our environment. That's it. That's how I would manage it. It's it's not a discussion anymore. Uh, Isaiah has another question here. Uh, what are some common embedded issues that it can impact the logic of a controller? Uh, plenty. <laughs> Most of the time, it's related to resource handling or weird interactions between things, especially when you wind up with uh, dynamic sections of memory. Let's say, for example, uh, a lot of devices have, like if it was a Modbus device, someone's put it in there that if this, this register gets set to a one, uh, you could reset the device. That kind of thing won't show up in uh, just a high level vulnerability scan for a device, right? A vendor has no idea that you, you, did, you set that register to reboot it. You have no idea as a vendor. And, and even the VXWorks or whoever built the stack doesn't matter, right? If it's like a Trek stack or Triangle Microworks, it doesn't matter. So those extra steps are really tricky to work with. Um, those are common behaviors that I see. Uh, common embedded issues that I often see will have that, that can impact the logic of a controller. Uh, generally, a lot of times, no one's frequently checking to see it. So they look at offline configuration files versus the ones that are local uh, on those devices. So they don't compare them. The other thing to do is to change up your polling rates a little bit so that's, that it's not consistent. If I'm a very smart attacker, I will go after the, the, the polling rate uh, so let's say I know it's consistently 30 days. So I will change the configuration potentially if it's invisible change, like maybe there's a very consistent uh, period of no operation and no one will notice the PLC go offline for a second. I will go change the, the logic right before that pull-in window and then change it right back afterwards. That's another case there that you need to be monitoring for, uh, not just at the network level, but as part of your asset management, right? You need to compare what is good and, and what you should be doing. That also aids your recovery. Most organizations do not have a good process for recovering embedded assets. They don't. Uh, they also don't have a great way to secure the assets that are that are talking to the systems and trying to redeploy them when there's an outage. So there's off. It's mo I would say most vulnerabilities for these systems uh, is around around those those around those areas. Has anyone ever uh, published a general secure deployment guidelines for controllers? Oof, uh, there's a lot of open ones. Uh, I don't think, well, 62443 is a, is a good recommendation on how to kind of build out your organization and apply a set of controls. I don't think there's one per se for uh, each, each one exactly, um, but each vendor often does it. So GE has their secure deployment guidelines. Schneider Electric has theirs. Rockwell has theirs. The, the thing to keep in mind is that, and if you have access to all of those, that's even better. You go through them and you build a, summar, a summarized kind of profile of what all of them are trying to say to you and you adjust it to your environment. The reason why I say that is that if you go all into one camp's uh, paradigm, you might be missing uh, pieces out of the others. It's like when you're studying for a certification or studying for something in school. You have your, your, your main kind of concept to look at and then you have supplementary information that might be written by a different author. That different author might have a different perspective and help you know have good pieces that reduce the risk to you. So I look at things a little bit uh, at a holistic level and it's not actually more extra work at the end of the day. It actually winds up with a better process, uh, better security and all sorts of things. It's time up front, saves you time later and reduces the amount of rot that you'll deal with over time. Um, I, and I have a bunch of other questions. Again, I recognize that we're running up on time. So you know, anytime, please reach out to me by email uh, and I would love to schedule a session to discuss this further. Um, there's only so much we can do at an introductory level, and I'd be more than happy to, to, to have any, to field any questions or to even write the responses in a generic sense uh, if, if, you know, anonymity is preferred. 
on a blog or you know some other mechanism or even do internal uh, conferences for your own organization. So please reach out and uh, thank you very much.